America. My name is I'm Yosef Frimpong, and I'll tell you, people are getting agitated in school boards all across these United States about critical race theory. Thought So I thought I'd put a little bit of explainer together and in two minutes explain what it is. It's going to go fast, right? <coughs> so the target of critical race theory isn't white people. <coughs> The target of critical race theory is formal theory, right? So formal theory is this method of evaluation that touts itself to be so robust that it could deal with all content, regardless of the content or how the content operates in other contexts. So one form of formalism is the legal method, right? So the law is supposed to be able to deal with everyone the exact same, which means that if there's a change in the court's position, it's not due to external factors or the people involved. It's due to a new law given or by the legislature or a deeper interpretation of existing law. Right? So the problem is that that's not how the judiciary works. They don't just apply the law to a case based on facts because every case comes with a ton of facts, right? And many of the facts would support opposing legal determinations. So we have to pick and choose facts. And you can't just apply precedents either because no two cases are the same and there are a ton of precedents. So you're picking and choosing which precedent. <coughs> and... Uh, <coughs> And different precedents will support different verdicts, right? So Derek Bell is a legal scholar who took critical legal theories attack against formal legal theory, this idea that we just, like, apply the law that's given to us by the legislature and said, like, one, there are many laws given to you by the legislature. And uh, he applied it to, like, issues of race, right? So let's take the Brown decision in uh, 1954, the one that uh, ended state-mandated state desegregation. <coughs> For decades, courts upheld desegregation. And then in 1954, the case of Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court reversed its course, using the 14th Amendment to run uh, to, uh, to end state-mandated segregation and to render it unconstitutional. Now, but by 1954, the Fourth Amendment had been around. It was 80 years old. So is there something else? There was something else that was doing the work. It wasn't some sort of moral awakening. So what was really doing the work? Um, to account for the change in the Supreme Court's like posture towards state-sponsored desegregation, state-mandated state -mandated segregation. Well, um, Bell looks at, at, at three factors, right, who had a very big interest in what the court said. It wasn't the law. It was, one, anti-communism. And if you don't know, the world was being split between the West and the Soviets around, and the Cold War was heating up. And everything the U.S., every time the U.S. would try to make moves, all the Soviets had to say was like, you know, whatever, you guys lynch Negroes. Whatever, you're human rights, you guys lynch Negroes. And what's, it's, it's a li <laughs> excuse me, it's a little bit funny because uh, there are like many versions of this. There's a Czech version, you guys lynch Negroes, and the Hungarian version, you guys lynch Negroes, and a Polish version. It was a big old joke. Like, <clears throat> America's moral authority was a big old joke because at the end of the day, you're just the country that lynches Negroes. And so this was big, becoming a problem for our hearts and soul campaigns of, of people. You know, foreign dignitaries would come to the United States, and if they were not white, they'd be treated like trash. And then the foreign press would re report on it. So, like, it was really screwing up our ability to be persuasive in, in the developing world, the fact that from time to time we lynch Negroes, right? The second factor that uh, Brown, uh, that, that Bell points to that, that kind of, turned the Supreme Court was the fact of w, uh, World War II blacks. So, <laughs> got to understand, we had pretty big guns at this time, and there was a mass of black people who'd come from shooting white people uh, for freedom uh, in the United States. They were coming home now and being brutalized by American discrimination, and so there was a kind of a rumbling among those World War II veterans that, uh, you know, this was supposed to be a war for freedom. We went and fought that, and then we come home and be treated like this. This, is, this might not go the way they wanted to. So there was like a more dis, uh, dis ease and a rumbling among the class of black veterans who had fought in World War II and uh, who were watching themselves get passed by by these great society programs that were segregated against them. And they had guns, and they knew how to use them. So domestic tranquility required, you know, we pacified these black veterans in a way that we might not have had to in the past. Uh, and the third thing was 
the rural South was still rural, kind of a plantation society in its infrastructure. And uh, elite whites needed, like, started to notice that if we ever want to industrialize the South, or at least make it more economically viable, an economically viable center, we need to uh, like kind of tamp down the uh, the the segregation, the, and the discrimination and lynchings and all that. It's bad for business. So anti-black racism became bad for business. Now remember, <coughs> this means as soon as anti-black racism becomes good for business, it'll go right back in. But you have to understand that these three are three these three factors are um, anti-communism, pacifying black, uh, military veterans in general and black military veterans in, in particular, and the uh, economic stake in having a South that like, could actually do business. These three factors figured into the changing of the Supreme Court's uh, you know, posture regarding state-sponsored segregation. Right? And there are arguments in the time of, of, around these three factors that, that Bell lists in his, uh, in, uh, well, he has a, a paper here that's, uh, what, Brown versus Board of Education and the Interest Convergence Dilemma. So that, that's, the, that's the name of one of Bell's papers on this. And if you tell a story about the Brown verdict without talking about anti-communism, because make no mistake, the Russians, they were looking, I guess this is longer than two minutes, the Russians were looking at us like, like this guy. The Russians were looking at black people like we were on the menu. And um, because, you know, at the end of the day, they were like, look, you can go with the Americans, but the Americans, um, <coughs> this guy, this guy's funny. Yeah. You go with the Americans, the Russians were looking at uh, black people like this guy. So you can go with the Americans, but the Americans are going to treat you like trash. And so that was the uh, the the, the anti-communism play. So, so yeah, anti-communism figured into the civil rights verdict. And you have to understand that the court's a lot weaker than you think it is. It doesn't control legislative budgets, and it doesn't control the executive. So it pretty much needs a lot of political will and money from other people and support from other people to have its orders be realized. But it can't like, it can't admit that because it has to be about the law or seem about the law. So there are all these other factors that influence the court's decision. So you don't really understand the decision unless you understand these other factors. And you also don't understand the Cold War unless you understand how it figured, like, the role of civil rights in the Cold War. So you don't understand the Cold War, and you don't understand Brown versus uh, Board of Education unless you see the relationship those two had with each other. Right? And so a, an uncritical, a formal account of both the Cold War and the, uh, the Brown verdict will leave out the relationship they have to each other <laughs> and tell you, well, you know, the Brown verdict was just about applying the 14th Amendment, when really it was about, like, what happened with it. It happened within a context that determined it one way or the other. And um, so, yeah, so if you, want, if you want to actually know, if you, and you'll end up with an underdeveloped account of the truth if you just go with the formal method. You'll get an underdeveloped account of what it means to be the to have the Brown verdict, and you'll also have dif a distorted notion of how to create justice cam um, campaigns because you'll just think, well, if I put the right laws in place, then like the court will be on my side. No, you need the other context, right? So if you don't know the kind of the context, if you don't have the the skills, the critical skills to actually see the influence of all of these other people who are interested in the court's take on race and how that actually affects the court, then you actually dis are distorted about what justice entails and what justice campaign entails, um, justice campaigns entail, right? So either you can have a robust understanding of the verdict or you have an underdeveloped understanding of the, uh, the verdict. And I don't know, I think we should be teaching people the truth. So that's my defense of critical race theory. Do you want the messy truth about history and all of its moving parts? Or do you want an over overly formalized distortion that pretends to tell you everything but actually tells you nothing? <coughs> There's a way in which, uh, you know, before 2008, the econ we almost turned everything to the economists. Everyone's like, well, you know, you just treat everything like the economists treat uh, the economy and everything will be fine. The problem is 2008 happened and we realized that the economists, the formal methods of the economists weren't even actually 
adequate to the like the realistic swings of the economy, right? So formal la- formal methods that seem to be able to be applied to everything without actually talking about anything just distort your understanding of everything. Instead, you actually have to look at the content of what you're dealing with and who else, and all of the interests that have, um, uh, uh, you know, that see whatever you're dealing with as a functional part of themselves, right? So the Brown wor- verdict was a functional part of our anti-communism campaign. It was also a functional part of our black military pacification campaign. And the Brown verdict was a functional part of our economic campaign to develop the, uh, the rural South, Right? It didn't happen like as a legal thing, abstracted from all of its like all of these other sectors that had an interest, a controlling interest and an effective interest in the court's verdict. All right. So hope this was helpful. Peace.